Without a doubt, one of the top highlights of our Japan Coaster Tour was visiting Fuji Q Highland. This is a small park with some amazing rides. It's located at the base of Mount Fuji, so it has an outstanding backdrop that we did not see once during our visit, which was by far the biggest disappointment about this park. But that's okay, I'm not that salty. It gives me an excuse to go back. And I think the park more than made up for it. This is gonna be my full in-depth review about the place, because there is a lot to discuss. We're gonna go through the pros, the cons and tips if you're planning a visit to Fuji Q Highland. Now, first thing I want to discuss is this park is really easy to access. If you're visiting Japan, there's a good chance that you're taking transit everywhere. And the easiest part about it is that there is a train station literally at the park, aka a couple dozen feet away from one of the entrances. The actual park is located in Yamanashi, Japan. It's in a pretty urban area, despite the fact that it's near Mount Fuji. And once you kind of get towards Mount Fuji, there's less and less city. So while this part of the country Country does not have a bunch of huge skyscrapers like Tokyo. It is in a well-developed area, unlike some of the other parks that we went to in Japan. So that is, in my opinion, a huge pro if you're planning on going here. No need to worry about buses or anything. So you get to the entrance. It's going to cost you 5,700 yen to get in, which is a rough equivalent to about 57 US dollars. However, if you bring your passport, and show it at the ticket booth, you get a record 100 yen discount, which equals to about $1 off. So, I mean, hey, might as well take advantage of it. It's not a killer deal, but it's something. When we visited, we did do two days at the park, and I'm gonna discuss what those days looked like a little bit later, but I do wanna emphasize that I was very glad that we had those two days. This and Fantasia Land are what I like to call huge small parks, as in the actual land they take up is not very big, but they have so much to do because there was a lot of attractions packed into a small space. And because I had such a fun time at the park, I had no problem paying that 5,700 yen a second time just to go back in. So now that you've bought your ticket, what do you do next? You gotta go through the turnstiles, and I've never seen anything else like this anywhere around the world. Everything is done through face detection. So when you're going through the entrance, they take your picture, and then anytime you're about to board a roller coaster or a major ride, they take your picture once again and it verifies that yes, you are in the park. And I thought that was so interesting. And the system is smart. Like at one point, I left the park to go get shots from the outside and I didn't need a hand stamp or anything. I just left and then when I came back in, through a different entrance, might I add, it detected that I was already in the park and let me back in. It was brilliant. It seriously makes me think about Universal's Epic Universe because apparently they're supposed to have some sort of function similar to this. It makes me wonder, are they getting the same system that Fuji Q has? Yes. I don't know, but I had no issues with it at all whatsoever. There are two possible entrances you can go through. The main one you see here, and then the back entrance you see here. This was the entrance that was close to the train station. But if you want to walk from one entrance to the other, both being on opposite sides of the park, it would not take you very long at all. And something I thought was kind of cool is that on the main pathways, they have these lines. And the lines equate to different rides, AK, if you follow one of the lines, it will eventually lead you to the attraction that you're trying to ride. I thought that was really kind of neat. I didn't study the park layout at all before coming here, and even though I didn't really use this system, I could see how it could definitely benefit someone if they're lost and trying to find where stuff is. And even though the park is small, they do have some nooks and crannies. Some of these attractions are a little bit hidden. And I don't say that about every park. I mean, both Nasu Highland and Yomira Land and several other Japan parks we visited were all bigger than Fuji Q, but I didn't get lost in those parks. There were some moments where I was wandering around Fuji Q and I'm like, I don't remember this pathway at all. So they've really managed to take advantage of the land. So let's get into what everyone's wanting to discuss, the rides. I'm not gonna go in depth to the four major roller coasters because I do have a review of each one of them on my channel already. Be sure to go check those out. I go way in depth with them. But the first thing we did on that first day when we got here was go straight for Dodonpa, followed by Takabisha, Edgenaika, and a couple other attractions that we didn't actually do Fujiyama until the second day we were there. But this is a major tip that you'll wanna keep in mind if you're visiting. The way Fuji Q has their queue system set up is a little deceiving. They will close off the lines early so that that way, the last people are on before the park has closed for the day. Which means if you're trying to get last ride of the night on something, you really gotta strategize because they'll look at it, say, okay, 
Fujiyama has an hour line right now. Park closes at five, so we're gonna cut the line off at four. And here's the real kicker. Even if you enter the line during park hours, if you're still in line when the park closes, you will not be able to ride. The last train is sent at park closing. And they do a pretty good job at shutting off the queues so that everyone in line is able to ride. Like I actually managed to secure a front row ride on Dododampa for the last ride of the night by pure luck. I got in the queue right before they shut it off. And even though there were people behind me, because we were a group of two trying to line up with some other people and get the front row, it just so happened that we were able to get last ride of the night. It was crazy. Still, that is something that you want to keep in mind. You got to be careful with how you plan out getting in line for these rides. You pretty much got to check up, see what the wait time is, and then figure out approximately when that means they'll shut off the queues. Next thing I wanted to discuss involving the queues. The single rider lines here double as the skip the lines. So think of it this way. You can pay to go skip the line or you can enter that line anyways as a single rider and get on. But they do give prior priority to those people with fast passes single rider they only pull you if there is a single rider which of course means you will not get to pick your seat and i think you also got to be kind of careful about some of these single rider lines because some of them are way better than others the single rider line on fujiyama was kind of a joke i was not impressed with it at all moved ridiculously slow edge and Nika, hit or miss on one side i got on almost immediately as a single rider skipped the entire line on that side and the last thing i'll mention kind of involving that fast pass line if there are any fast pass people in that line they will get you on immediately priority over everyone else in the standby line it's not like they'll let in some standby then some fast pass and back to standby it's like no if there's anyone in the fast pass line that actually paid for fast pass you get right on next thing i want to discuss lockers each one of these coasters have them and they are in the station and what's so brilliant about them is that they are free it keeps your stuff safe you're able to use everything in line and then just put it in there right before you ride and it doesn't slow down operations it is brilliant I don't know why more parks don't have this system. It's fantastic. And I have an operations video about Fuji Q, so go ahead and watch that. You'll see that when I timed them, their operations really were not as bad as people were making them seem. So I really gotta commend them for this locker policy. Once you lock up your stuff, you get the key on this little wrist strap that you have on you while you ride, and it's not gonna fly off or anything, and then you just go retrieve your stuff right back at the lockers when you're done. It's fantastic. And speaking of lockers, when you go to ride Ed Janica, you will be putting your shoes in those lockers as well because the Edge and Ica loading system is really strange. They fill the train by assigning your row and then you stand in a loading area dedicated to that row. So then when it's your time to ride, they just open up that loading area and you know where to go. It's really kind of hard to explain, but I've never seen this loading system before in my life. I thought it worked, but it wasn't perfect. Another thing that I loved about these roller coasters is that each of them had their own custom soundtrack and you'll hear it while you're waiting. Dodonpas is very intense. It's kind of like dodon don pa dodon don't pa. Edge and Ica's is very happy. It's Edge and Ica. Edge and Ica. Edge and Ica. <laughs> Fujiyama's is very godlike, and I'll be frank, I don't remember what Takabishi's was like at all. But I thought Edge and Ica's by far had the best. It was so catchy. And the other thing that was nice is that they'll play those on and off, and when they aren't playing them, they'll do their audio announcements, and they'll be in Japanese as well as English. So you'll be able to hear everything the Japanese people are hearing and understand it. And the translations are done well. They're not like some janky mistranslated information. It's like, no, it's a real proper English announcement. And I thought that was incredibly helpful. So that's about everything I want to mention as far as the four main roller coasters go. I next want to discuss the atmosphere of the park because this one was kind of strange. It didn't have that classic Japanese charm that a lot of these other parks had. Like Yomira Land's charm was very distinct. So was Greenland's. Fuji Q sort of felt like a combination of an American amusement park with a weird Japanese twist. The park has its quirks, but is not as weird as some of these other Japan parks, which I thought was kind of sad because I like the weird. Some of the weird things I liked, they have a frisbee at this park that is themed to the pizza restaurant located directly next to it. And I thought that was hilarious. Evangelion World is a room with props in it from this movie or game or something. I don't know. I'd never heard of it. You put on these glasses and stand in a room and then you watch a show on this giant screen. They have a flying theater similar to Soren. The mascot, who's your classic character bringing you through the attraction, has hair that looks like Mount Fuji. It was really kind of funny. And that ride as a whole was pretty cool. We did it when it was raining and a lot of the other rides were closed. And because it was completely indoors, of course it was open. It was a very well done flying theater. There's one point where it gives you the illusion that it flips you upside
upside down, all while it's taking you on a tour throughout Japan and Mount Fuji. That attraction is called Fuji Airways, by the way. And then one of the coolest quirks is they have two year-round haunted attractions. The first one is one I did an entire video on. It's this 20-minute long maze that is an upcharge attraction. And the way it works is it's essentially $40 for a group of four, aka about $10 a person. But you can't just buy a one-person ticket. You have to buy it for a group. If you are one person, you're paying the full $40 just for yourself. So therefore, the best way to do it is have a group of four, and then it's a better deal for everyone. And this haunted hospital is in a very secluded section of the park, way out in the back corner. And there are scare actors in there. Not as much as I was like, but the theming, I mean, it is top notch. It looks like a real abandoned, creepy hospital. So it was really cool. If you're going there for the first time, it is something worth doing. But an attraction that I think you could argue was better is Endless Haunted Mine. It's basically a wacky shack where you sit in this vehicle, they strap down your arms, you put on headphones, and then it takes you through a dark, kind of creepy, scary setting where they're playing music and whispering and all this weird stuff through the headphones and it makes everything sound really close. So it just puts you on edge the entire time. The sound design is fantastic. And they do have some actors in there that when the vehicle goes by, They'll like touch your shoulder. So it like freaks you out. It absolutely exceeded our expectations. So those are some of the weird rides about the park. There's two themed areas that I thought were kind of quirky. And they're pretty much the only themed areas in the park. The first one is Thomas Town. This is the kids area. And it's actually very well done. I really quite liked it. This is a fantastic kids area. Lots of different attractions for the young ones. Great theming. I never really watched the show growing up, but I'm guessing that a lot of the buildings that they had there were designed to look like it came straight out of the show and so that was one of the better areas of the park the nicest area of the park however isn't even in the park they have an entire france village located directly outside the front entrance and it has this elaborate theming like it looks straight out of a european theme park which when it's designed to look like the streets of france I mean, they nailed it. It was so well done. I was so impressed. So that is one of the reasons why you might want to exit the park is so you can go through this little area. The only ride that they have there is a carousel. Not even a large one. It's just a small double-decker one. But they have really pretty gardens. They have a replica of the Eiffel Tower. And it gives you really nice views of Takabisha. So those are the two themed areas. Everything else is just classic Midway, which is okay. It'd be nice if there were some more themed areas. But I mean, hey, Fuji-Q is kind of about thrills anyways. So I didn't mind. A few other quirks I noticed while in the park, while he was waiting in line for the wild mouse, may it rest in peace, has since been removed since we visited. There was a cat hanging out underneath it. I was like, yo, what the heck? And at one point we were walking along and there was this cute little trolley going by and we were like, oh, look at that. It's probably for live entertainment or something, but no, guess what it is? It's a trash collector. It's this cute vehicle that just drives around the park and then it stops at a trash can. They load up the trash on it, fill it with a new bag, set down and keep going. I was like, man, that's great. So I was impressed with that. They had a fun little paddle boat experience where you can go out in these brightly colored boats on the water and just pedal around. It actually gets pretty tiring, but it was fun. I mean, it was a unique experience. Not too many places have something like that. So I want to talk about food for a little bit. I did have a few meals here. First one was I did eat at that pizza place that was located next to that giant frisbee theme to the restaurant. Yeah, so I ate at that restaurant. It was pretty good pizza. I liked it. They had lots of different topping options, and it kind of goes back to what I was talking about where in some ways it felt similar to an American American amusement park because there were not very many parks in Japan that offered something like pizza. I also had a pretty good chicken sandwich at Moss Burger, which is a Japanese fast food restaurant chain that is located in Fuji-Q. And it's pretty good food. If you've never had Moss Burger, I recommend trying it out. But because the park closed around five, I never had dinner here. I just did lunch because I really wanted to maximize my time by not sitting around and eating. So I definitely didn't try out everything here. But the food that I had, I enjoyed. One of the last things I'll mention is a recommendation. At some point if you get the chance you should go to the top of this mini Mount Fuji that they have in the center of Dodonpa's turnaround. It's kind of off the beaten path you have to go up this small little back hill that if you blink you'll miss the entrance to it but when you stand on top of this little mountain you get a 360 view of the park and you really just see how amazing the skyline is here. Just big towering roller coasters everywhere. It's visually very impressive and it's probably the best view of Dodonpa you'll get. So I think it just goes back to when you go here, plan enough time so you're able to wander around everywhere, find all the nooks and crannies, I think you'll be surprised. So in conclusion, to wrap up this review of Fuji-Q Highland, this park was a big surprise to me. You know, going in here, 
I had heard a lot of bad things about this park. On paper, it looked amazing, and so it was very highly anticipated for me, but I had heard horror stories. I was told, oh, you're gonna need to buy fast passes for every ride, and I was prepared to spend the money, but the queues were not as bad as they could be. We took advantage of single rider lines. We had two days, so you know, on the first day when we had really nice weather, we were able to do some rides, but then the second day, when it rained in the afternoon then it shut down some of the rides, there were still plenty of indoor attractions that we were able to take advantage of. So you've heard me mention a lot of different things revolving around this park. The big takeaway that you should have is you gotta maximize your time when you go here. If you have time to do two days, you absolutely should. If you only have one, I'd say probably get a fast pass, especially if you're not a single rider, because there's a lot to do here and you don't want to waste any time waiting for roller coasters, even though oftentimes I only waited maybe 30, 45 minutes for some of these rides because Fuji Q was one of the few parks that we went to in Japan that was actually busy. But if you want to guarantee that you're able to get on all of the different rides that I talked about, then you probably want to have an extra day because these parks, they close earlier than a lot of the other parks in America. I would have loved a 10 o'clock close here, get some night rides on some of these rides, but just isn't possible. So in conclusion, I had a really positive experience here. The park is not perfect. It isn't really pretty outside of the France themed area. The setting is gorgeous, but the actual park, you know, it looked fine. But in terms of thrills and attractions, I mean, they are fantastic. What more could you want? I would absolutely go back here. This is one of those places that if you're in Japan, I mean, you gotta go here. If you're a coaster enthusiast, put this place on your bucket list. But that's gonna do it for this review of Fuji Q Highland in Yamanashi, Japan. Let me know down in the comments section below if you've been here, if you agree with my thoughts, if you think there's anything I missed. I mean, I try to mention as many attractions and highlights as I can, but I'm sure there's some stuff I missed. So you can post about that down below as well as any other tips you might have for someone that's looking to visit here. But if you're new to the channel, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I've reviewed theme parks around the world and will continue to do so, so you won't want to miss them. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.